Well, hello, and welcome to the Kave 2020 virtual community and our second webinar in a series of special speakers made available to our Kave 2020 virtual community and our friends at Caslon. I'm Jan Gustafson Correa, CEO for Kave. And while I wish we could have been together in San Francisco for the Kave 2020 conference last year, While I wish we could have been together in the Kave 2020 conference um, last week, um, we hope that now you are in a safe place managing the circumstances due to the COVID-19 situation and that you're ready to join together today with your Kave Familia and over the next several weeks via the Kave 2020 virtual community website and webinars. So to get us started today in our wonderful presentation, I'm here to introduce you to our Kave board president, Olivia Yaya. Olivia? Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Today is being presented by our longtime friend, researcher, coach and guide, Dr. Jim Cummins, and sponsored by the generous support of Caslon Publishing and Consulting, a platinum level sponsor of Kave 2020. As we get ready for today's exciting session, I have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speaker's microphones will be active and the participants will all be on mute. If you would like to pose a question during the presentation, please use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen. And the chat window will pop up where you will be able to type in your question or comment. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version of the Kave 2020 virtual community website so you can re-listen and share it with others. Sit back, relax, and get ready for 45 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. To get us started, join me in welcoming Rebecca Field of Caslon Publishing and Consulting, who will introduce you all to Dr. Jim Cummins who will be presenting today on effective education for multilingual students, the central roles of translanguaging, literacy engagement, and identity negotiation. Welcome, Rebecca and Caslon. Hi, hello from Philadelphia. I'm so happy to be here with you, although virtually, and I wish that I was able to have been with you last week in San Francisco, but I'm happy to say that all of us, especially Jim, will be there in Long Beach next year and we'll continue the conversation there. What we're gonna hear today and what I've always admired about Jim is his ability to seamlessly relate research and theory on multilingualism and education on the one hand, with policy and practice in um, that improves lives for multilingual learners, teachers, administrators, and schools, well, all of us on the other hand. You'll also see this orientation in his new book, co-authored with uh, Raymond DiSola, and it's titled Transforming Sanchez School, Equity, Shared Leadership, and Evidence, and we publish it at Caslon. You can order this at our website, which is www.caslonpublishing.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to present Jim Cummins. A round of applause. I've ever heard. Um, oops, sorry. Am I muted? Um, OK, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, that's a round, the loudest round of virtual applause I've ever heard. So thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of this, uh, this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you all for tuning into the webinar and also uh, to personally thank Jan and her CAVI colleagues for organizing it with the support of Rebecca and her colleagues at CASLAM. I also want to acknowledge how difficult this time is for all of us, both in North America and in our broader global community. I know it's especially challenging for educators who can no longer meet directly with their students and who must um, uh, and who are actively exploring how far we can push online distance education to make it work as well as possible for our students and our, uh, and our communities. This has come home personally to me as my daughter is in her first year of teaching in Toronto. She's teaching at the grade five level in a, uh, in a 
French English bilingual program. And in the past two weeks, she's learned a lot about Google, Google Classroom and Google Hangouts and figuring out how to teach a class of 28 kids uh, using those tools. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you again who've uh, taken the time to participate in the webinar. And um, I think we're forging, we're in the process, all of us in our global communities of forging new kinds of communities that hopefully will lead to some good things in the future. So let me just share my screen uh, with you and get into the content of the webinar. Um, let's see. Okay, my title uh, is uh, Effective Education for Multilingual Students, the Central Roles of Translanguaging, Literacy Engagement, and Identity Negotiation. And I'd like to just uh, spend a moment or two just letting you know where that title came from. All of us are committed to effective education for all students, but particularly for, particularly for students who have been ill-served by the school system in the past. And when we look at what's important, I think we need to step back a little bit and ask ourselves, okay, what do we know? What's the evidence that's out there about effective schooling for students who are learning the school language? Uh, and I want to highlight the roles of uh, what has come to be known as translanguaging over the past 10 years or so, but which essentially highlights the importance of students' home languages and the uh, benefits that come when we mobilize students' home languages in the classroom whether we're, we're in a bilingual program or dual language program or in a monolingual English program with kids from multiple language backgrounds. That's a core element of what we need to do. But we also need to focus on research that's been neglected uh, in the broader community, focusing on the role of literacy engagement in students' development of reading comprehension and literacy development uh, generally. Uh, this uh, has been neglected. Uh, there's been all kinds of reading wars going on over the last 30, 40 years and beyond that. And one of the things that has been uh, not highlighted sufficiently, in my view, is the research highlighting the fact that when we get students actively engaged with literacy from a very early age, and I'm talking at the preschool level, uh, their literacy development uh, gets boosted in big time ways. And this is particularly the case for students from uh, low income backgrounds who may not have the same kinds of access to, uh, to books and other cultural resources such as iPads or uh, um, techno technological tools that the more affluent uh, middle class kids uh, might have. Jim, and then- uh, Jim, excuse me, um, Dr. Cummins, excuse me one second. I'm not sure we're able to see your screen. And I wonder oh. if you could double check sharing your screen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, um, the voice inside your head. <laughs> okay. um, let me close this. Um, I'll walk you through it if you go to the okay, bottom okay, control me, bar. Okay, I think I've got it right now. Perfect. Sorry about that. Beautiful, we can see it very clearly. Thanks so much. Okay, there we go. Okay, I've talked about the title, which hopefully you can see at this point. Um, thanks for letting me know the, the glitch, Jan. Um, so let me just give you a little overview of, of what I want to talk about. First of all, I'll, I'll just give a brief recap of my own connections with CABE over the past 40 years. CABE has been uh, my mentor in many ways, and the two-way interaction that um, I've had with colleagues at CABE have been really fundamental to my own development uh, and my own academic uh, work. Um, the, the journey over the past 40 years, of, as many of you in the audience know, has been undertaken by many committed educators focused on establishing the legitimacy of bilingual education, which for ideological and political reasons was rejected for many, many years. And, the other researchers and myself and, and colleagues at CABE have focused on trying to document the cognitive, academic, and linguistic benefits of bilingualism. Uh, we've looked at the relationships with, uh, across languages, what I've called cross-linguistic interdependence, and the, the importance of teaching for two-way transfer between uh, first and second languages. And also the necessity for educators through their instruction to actively challenge inequality. 
and what I, in uh, some of my CAVE publications, have called coercive relations of power. Uh, so I'll get into uh, that recap uh, in just a moment, just to kind of uh, remind some of you and let some of you know, probably for the first time, some of the work that has been undertaken by CAVE and colleagues over the past 40 years or so. And then I'd, I'd like to uh, look at what we need to do to close the achievement gap. And I'm going to argue, uh, as Raymond Isola and I have done in our book that uh, Rebecca mentioned, uh, that we've got to ground our policies and practice rigorously in the research evidence uh, regarding the causes of underachievement and instructional approaches that respond directly to these underlying causes. So that's where the presentation is going to go over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, what you see on the screen in front of you are four books. The one on the uh, top left of the screen was published in 1981. It wasn't uh, published directly by CABE, uh, but it was published by the California uh, Department of Education. Uh, they uh, invited uh, five researchers, Steve Krashen, myself, and, and three others, uh, to come together and together with them highlight what we know about bilingual education, what we know about uh, schooling and language minority students. And um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But I had one of the chapters in there that focused on the role of students' first language in their learning. Uh, in the, as I said, that was published in 1981. Uh, in 1989, the uh, CABI published a book that uh, I wrote uh, it had been rejected by uh, another publisher for, because the content was seen as a little bit too uh, direct, shall we say. Um, but it, it highlighted the importance of looking at power relations in, um, in looking at what effective education uh, was. And essentially, the point of the book was that uh, we need to actively become aware of how power relations work within our schools, how societal power relations uh, impact what's happening between teachers and educators. And in order to provide effective education, we need to actively challenge the role of coercive power relations. That was followed up um, by a book called Negoti Negotiating Identities, Education for Empowerment in a Diverse Society. The first edition of that came out in 1996. You can see it on the left. And then a, a second edition came out in 2001. And uh, again, those were published by CABE. And uh, the uh, 2001 edition uh, has now, thanks to CABE, been made available uh, for download, free download for anybody who wants it. Um, so it's still out there. So let me just um, go back and elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, there were two theoretical papers uh, invited by the California Department of Education one by me and one by Steve Krashen. And Steve, uh, in his uh, article, unpacked the notion of comprehensible input, which I'm sure many of you have uh, heard about multiple times uh, over the course of your teaching careers. And I talked about the interdependence hypothesis and tried to show how cross-linguistic transfer enables students in bilingual programs to catch up academically. So it highlighted the fact that even though uh, students in a bilingual program were spending less time through the medium of English, they were doing at least as well and typically much better by the end of uh, elementary school compared to students who were in all English programs. And that seemed counterintuitive to many people at the time because how can less English instruction lead to greater English achievement? But that's what we've observed over and over again over the past 40 years. Down at the bottom you see some of the people in the, the California Department of Education at the time who were inspirational in getting the research out to schools and creating a, a shared language for how we talked about these issues. Um, one of the uh, diagrams that was in this book uh, was a little cartoon uh, that tried to get across the, what we know about the effects of bilingualism and children's development. This was a, a, an area that I had done my own um, doctoral research on. And so it was something that I, that I was fairly familiar with. But it says, one wheel can get you places. In other words, with one language, you can do fine in a, a limited way. So can a big wheel and a little wheel, if you know some second language, uh, that's fine too. 
However, when your wheels are nicely balanced and fully inflated, you'll go further, provided, of course, the people who made the wheels knew what they were doing. And that last um, diagram uh, reflects the reality for many students, uh, many emerging bilingual students uh, prior to the 1970s who were provided with no support in school to learn the school language and who were often punished for speaking their home language at school. So they didn't have the opportunity to develop first language literacy and often their uh, literacy skills in English didn't develop that well either. So that was trying to sum up in, you know, uh, one image, one composite image, what the research was saying. And I'll just give you one example of the kinds of, of research that has been carried out uh, over the past 40 years. Uh, this was a, um, a, a research study looking at uh, how bilingualism and knowledge of other languages facilitated students' ability to learn languages. Um, uh, the researchers uh, looked at English Mandarin and English Sp Spanish bilinguals who learned both languages prior to schooling, and they were compared to monolingual English speakers and how well they mastered words in an invented language that, no, that bore no resemblance to English, Spanish, or Mandarin. And the result of that, the, what they found was that the bilingual pa participants mastered nearly twice the number of words as the monolinguals. And down at the bottom, it says it's not about um, being good at learning languages as something that's intrinsic. It's the experience of becoming bilingual itself that makes learning a new language easier. Uh, and the conclusion from this and uh, certainly hundreds of other studies uh, carried out over the last 40, 45 years is that using two or more languages is good for your brain. It increases students' metalinguistic awareness. Uh, it provides greater flexibility. There's even research out there that uh, suggests that knowing multiple languages and using them throughout your life staves off um, uh, dementia and other uh, illnesses that uh, uh, impair our brain functioning as we get older. So hopefully most of us in this webinar uh, will be able to uh, claim that benefit as time goes on. Um, so there's a short video that uh, you could share with uh, parents and students. It's uh, produced by the BBC. Uh, it's about two minutes long. It's a cartoon type video that sums up very nicely uh, a lot of what the research is saying, because I think students themselves need to know that their bilingualism is an advantage and something that they can be proud of. You will have access to the PowerPoint afterwards, so you can uh, get access to videos like this um, and other uh, resources in the PowerPoint later on. So I was able to um, uh, look at, as I said, how first and second languages uh, related to each other. And one of the things I tried to formulate was the interdependence hypothesis that basically said the two languages are interdependent. They, they, as, they, as we develop literacy in the two languages, uh, they come together there's a lot of overlap or interdependence across them. And one way of expressing this in a visual metaphor was the common underlying proficiency model. And this was elaborated in that 1981 um, article and, and in subsequent articles. And one way of looking at it is to think of language proficiency as an iceberg, uh, where the um, surface features of the language, the, the most obvious features, how we sound, how fluent we are, um, the, our accent, et cetera, are above the surface. That's, that's what we see. But as we know with icebergs, there's far more bulk, far more mass beneath the surface than there is on top. And so the, the aspects of language that are crucial for schooling in terms of whether students are going to succeed or not uh, are less obvious in terms of our language proficiency. And what the research is saying is that we can visualize bilingualism and by implication multilingualism as a, a double iceberg, where even though the surface features of the two languages are separate, uh, at a deeper level, there's a lot of interdependence or overlap between them. So different languages don't occupy separate spaces in our brains. There's overlap and interdependence among languages. Um, the, in, the, in the book, Empowering Minority Students, I'll just give you a sense of what I, I was trying to say there. There's a quotation uh, from chapter five, which is entitled Towards Anti-Racist Education. It says, previous attempts at educational reform have been largely unsuccessful because the relationships between teachers and students and between schools and communities have remained largely unchanged. 
In the past, educators have uncritically and in most cases unconsciously accepted rather than challenged the societal discrimination that's reflected in schools. What that was implying was that if we just go into our classrooms and teach the curriculum as it's written down in some generic form, and we're not necessarily connecting with our students, we're not um, affirming the knowledge that they're bringing into the classroom, and we're not affirming their ability as multilinguals, as intelligent human beings who can succeed. Uh, in the Negotiating Identities books, um, one of the things that I tried to highlight was the centrality of teacher agency or teacher choices. You can see the, um, the URL for downloading uh, this book at the top there. And again, you can get access to that afterwards. But again, I'll give you a sense of what I was trying to say uh, in that book. Um, uh, individual educators are never powerless. This is um, in the second or third last page of the book. And it's kind of wrapping up uh, the, I guess, the bottom line of what I was trying to say in the book. So individual educators are never powerless, although, although they frequently work in conditions that are oppressive for both them and their students. While they rarely have complete freedom, educators do have choices. They determine for themselves the social and educational goals they want to achieve with their students. They're responsible for the role definitions they adopt in relation to culturally diverse students and communities. And even in the context of English only instruction, educators have options in their orientation to students' language and culture, in the forms of parent and community participation they encourage, and in the way they Im implement pedagogy and assessment. In short, through their practice and, the inter and their interactions with students, educators define their own identities. So what I was trying to highlight there was the fact that we do have choices, even though at various stages, we're swimming uphill against uh, oppressive policies like those that were implemented in the context of No Child Left Behind, but we can still connect with our students in ways that are powerful. Um, one of the uh, frameworks or the diagrams that was um, in the Negotiating Identities book uh, looked at the role of societal power relations. And this is a variation of that, hopefully uh, a little bit clearer than what was in the book. But it's basically saying that broader societal power relations influence the ways in which educators define their roles. In other words, the, the teacher identities that we assume, what we're trying to do in our classroom, the answers we give to ourselves that when on a Monday morning, we walk into our classrooms and say, what am I doing here? Um, we should be, that's a serious question. We should know that. Um, so societal power relations influence our role definitions and also the structures of schooling in terms of curriculum, funding, assessment, et cetera. And so power relations are very evident in a number of uh, states and communities across the United States where uh, uh, schools uh, serving low income students get far less funding than schools serving uh, more affluent uh, students by reasons of the way uh, schools are funded. That reflects societal power relations. So these societal power relations influence the ways in which educators interact with linguistically and culturally diverse students. And these interactions form an interpersonal space within which learning happens and identities are negotiated. And these identity negotiations always either reinforce coercive relations of power or promote what I call collaborative relations of power. So what this is trying to say is that a major way in which power relations are either reinforced by schools or pushed back and challenged by schools is in the way we, ident we negotiate identities with our students. And so for example, if uh, a school has a policy as many schools uh, did and, and many schools around the world still do of um, uh, having an, an English only or a, a dominant language only uh, uh, policy within the school where students are reprimanded or punished even for speaking their home languages, this is reinforcing collaborative relations of power. And so we need to become aware of how that, those power relations work and actively push back against them. So like moving on to the, the second part of what I want to highlight, um, the question of what can we do in a concrete way uh, to reverse underachievement? And one of the things that hasn't been done uh, to any, uh, in any coherent way, as far as I know, is to look at uh, this in an analytic way. So in other words, which groups of students underachieve? Uh, why do they underachieve? What causal factors are operating? And what high impact evidence-based educational interventions are available? 
So if we exclude students um, who have special education needs and look at the research globally, there are three overlapping but conceptually distinct groups that tend to experience disproportionate underachievement. One of these groups are students from immigrant backgrounds who are learning the school language as a second language. Uh, we have students from low income or socially disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and we have students from socially marginalized groups who've been subject to racism and various forms of exclusion from educational and social opportunity, often over generations. If we look at uh, Native American students, if we look at African American students, if we look at Latino and, um, and Latina students, uh, we have discrimination and racism impacting uh, not just schooling, but every aspect of, of communities' lives over many generations. So if we look at, at those um, uh, three groups and look at, at the discourse that's uh, focused on these groups, what we see is a somewhat fractured response, where we haven't brought these together. Um, so the research is concerned with these three sources of potential educational disadvantage have worked largely in isolation from each other. So even though these sources of disadvantage are conceptually distinct, a significant proportion of students who underachieve fall into all three categories. So if we look at issues related to linguistically diverse students, they've been addressed by a variety of researchers whom you can see up there. There's many others, obviously. Uh, issues related to socioeconomic status have been addressed by researchers concerned with school improvement in general, Linda Darling-Hammond being a prominent uh, member of, of that group. Uh, but they haven't said very much about students' language uh, realities. And then issues related to racialized or marginalized students have been addressed by a variety of researchers focused on critical pedagogy and culturally responsive uh, and relevant instruction. And again, you can see some of the, those uh, uh, academics and, and researchers uh, there. But again, th we've looked at these issues in silos to some extent. And what I want to say is that we need to bring our responses together. And so what you see in the small print in front of you is um, a way of trying to look at how we can integrate our responses to uh, these uh, uh, three groups. So if we look at students from linguistically diverse backgrounds uh, and students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds and marginalized status backgrounds, there are different factors that um, result in, um, in potential disadvantage. And I say potential disadvantage because disadvantage only becomes realized when schools fail to do their job. Um, and so this looks at sources of potential disadvantage and then it looks at evidence-based instructional responses. Um, and these evidence-based instructional responses, if we look at uh, students from linguistically diverse backgrounds, we need to scaffold comprehension. As Steve Krashen has argued for many, many years, we need to uh, use particular strategies for making uh, input comprehensible to students. We use graphic organizers and a variety of other uh, ways of, of doing that. But one way of, of um, uh, doing it that has been neglected uh, in uh, monolingual programs involving multilingual students is engaging students' multilingual repertoires. This is what has been called translanguaging or come to be known as translanguaging over the past decade or so. And then we need to reinforce academic language across the curriculum. Um, academic language, as all of us know, has many specific characteristics that make it different from um, the, uh, the language we use in everyday social interactions. And th this is something that all students, whether they're monolingual in English or bilingual or multilingual, need to acquire. And it needs to be reinforced directly. When we look at students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, there are a variety of factors that we can't do very much about. We can't do very much directly in our schools about housing segregation, for example, which leads to school segregation. But one of the things we can do something about is the fact that research has documented that students coming from poverty backgrounds often tend to have less access to print in home and school. They may have a rich cultural life in the home, rich cultural interactions with parents and broader community members, and, but often parents don't have the money to buy books uh, or other cultural uh, tools like um, cell phones, iPads, uh, etc. And what the research shows very clearly is that the major determinant 
of reading comprehension is the extent to which students get actively engaged with literacy uh, in school. Obviously, we have to teach decoding skills, but once students get beyond the stage of uh, being able to decode print, what determines the extent to which they will become fluent and enthusiastic readers is the extent to which they actively engage with reading. And again, Steve Krashen has highlighted this in many publications. So the evidence-based instruction response would be to maximize print access and liter literacy engagement. And again, I would argue we need to reinforce academic language across the curriculum. Then if we look at students um, who've been subject to long-term discrimination uh, in the wider society or even shorter term discrimination there's a variety of factors up there that i won't go into detail about but again if we look at what the research suggests we need to do and what uh, researchers involved it with culturally sustaining uh, uh, pedagogy or culturally relevant pedagogy have highlighted is we need to connect instruction to students lives we need to decolonize curriculum and instruction through culturally sustaining pedagogy. We need to valorize and build on the language varieties in both first language and second languages that students bring to school. And we need to affirm students' identities in association with academic engagement. So if identity devaluation broadly defined is a source of potential underachievement, then it makes sense that we need to explore ways in which we can affirm students' identities uh, as they um, as they be, become literate and learn academic content. So I'll just go through the rest of this uh, fairly quickly. These are, are just, uh, this is just a summary of what I've said in relation to linguistically diverse students. But if we look at how engaging students' multilingual repertoires could um, help students and scaffold their instruction, this is an example that I've used in a number of presentations from research that Margaret Early, uh, a colleague in Vancouver and I did, um, about 15 years ago. But this was a, um, a dual language book that three students from Pakistan uh, wrote, Mediha, Sulmana, and Kanta. And Mediha had just arrived in uh, Toronto about six weeks before they, um, they started this, um, uh, this unit. It was a unit in immigration. Sulmana and Kanta had been in Canada for about three and a half years and were fairly fluent in English. So they, they um, uh, asked the teacher if they could write a story that reflected their own experiences and write it with an audience in mind of younger students from the same background. And so they suggested that they do it in both Urdu and English, which the teacher was very happy to, um, uh, to support. But the point I wanna make here is that they wrote a 20 page uh, bilingual book. It's beautifully illustrated, it's beautifully written. And if you had given Medea uh, the book that she wrote with her uh, two uh, uh, peers or two friends before she had written it. She would not have been able to understand it. Um, but after she had written it, she was able to uh, uh, understand it. That sounds paradoxical, uh, but the way it happened was that they discussed in Urdu what they were going to um, write about in the story. They invented a composite character called Sonia and in her story, they injected experiences that all three of them had had. They discussed in Urdu what was going to be in each page, what the um, uh, uh, illustration should look like. And then Sulmana was the scribe. She wrote the initial version in English. And then they consulted with the teacher about that. The teacher gave them feedback. And then they translated back from English into Urdu. And when you look at the um, uh, the videos that we've got of this process, you can see a lot of translanguaging going on. They're talking about, how do you say this in Urdu? No, that's not the word. I'll have to go home and, and I'll, I'll ask my mom about it. And so this is an example of not just scaffolding instruction, because they learned an enormous amount of English as they were doing this, but also obviously affirming identities um, and connecting to students' lives. So that's just one example of how we can um, implement evidence-based instruction relating to students' uh, linguistic diversities. If we look at students from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, um, as I said, one of the things that we do have control over is how we um, uh, treat literacy, the extent to which we get students actively engaged with literacy. And um, let me just give you one example of um, a study that highlights this. This is a study carried out in New Zealand uh, that uh, looked at factors in the preschool environment uh, before students came for formal schooling that um, 
uh, predicted achievement later on at age 14 and 16. And one of the things that stood out big time was what the researchers called literacy saturation in the preschool environment. The extent to which students were surrounded by books, the extent to which uh, teachers in the preschool environment read to students, drew their attention to print, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a lot of research uh, pointing in exactly the same direction. In the PowerPoint, uh, there's, uh, there are two slides at the back talking about the research relating to literacy engagement, which has been totally and um, I think inexcusably neglected in the United States context. And one of the um, major sources of data relating to this comes from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a big sort of economic think tank um, in, based in Paris, but with global scope. And over the past 20 years, they've been carrying out what they call their PISA studies, the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, and what they found is that um, reading in, students' reading engagement is a better predictor of literacy performance than uh, his or her socioeconomic background, indicating that cultivating a student's interest in reading can help overcome home disadvantages. And they do these surveys about every three years. And this has come out every year. And in their report in 2010, what they found was that about one third of the negative impact of low socioeconomic status is mediated through reading engagement or lack thereof. So in other words, there's about a one third overlap between the negative effect of low income, low socioeconomic status and the positive effect of reading engagement. What this means is that we could potentially push back about one third of the negative effects of low socioeconomic status if we could get students actively engaged with reading uh, from an early stage. If we're talking about bilingual programs, we can do this in both languages. Um, if we look at students from socially marginalized communities, there's a quotation from Gloria Latson Billings that I think goes right to the heart of the issue. Uh, she says, the problem that African-American students face is the constant devaluation of their culture, both in school and in the larger societies. And so what we need to do in terms of pushing back against that devaluation evaluation is connecting instruction to students' lives, lives, decolonizing curriculum and instruction, valorizing home language varieties, affirming students' identities in, associate, in association with uh, literacy development, and enabling students to use both their languages in powerful identity-affirming ways. So one example of this comes from a project that I was um, partially involved in, uh, involving indigenous students what in Canada we call First Nation students uh, in, at the high school level, where the, um, uh, the uh, school brought in a, um, uh, a, an elder from the community, an artist, a person called Rennie Mishaka. You can see him over on the right-hand side there. And he worked with students in terms of creating uh, art and poetry uh, in relation to uh, uh, their, their own cultural background. Um, we interviewed a lot of the students about their reaction to this. And one of the students who was particularly articulate was uh, a young woman called Cassandra. And uh, one of the things that she said was take away identity and what do you have? If you have a student that doesn't know who they are, do you think they care about what goes on in the classroom? And I think that says it all in terms of the importance of identity negotiation. Cassandra um, went on to talk about what the experience meant for her. She said, this experience gave me a gift of poetry I started to, to develop a passion for poetry during this project. I didn't know I had this passion. Since this project, I've written and shared many pieces of poetry. Participating in this project was li like hearing a collective voice telling me, we're proud of you, we care about you, you have a future. Being able to express my thoughts about who I am as an Ojibwe woman made me feel like I belonged and was connected to a larger community. I think this highlights one of the major issues that I want to uh, emphasize in the presentation, more than simply language issues are relevant to English learners' academic difficulties. Many students who are learning the school language come from low-income backgrounds and from socially marginalized groups. And it, what this implies is that in addition to providing language support, schools have also got to immerse students in a rich literacy environment and create context where students can use language and literacy for powerful identity affirming purposes. And just because we have a bilingual program or a dual language program doesn't necessarily mean we're engaging students actively with literacy and enabling them to use literacy 
and language for powerful identity affirming purposes. So these are principles that apply whether we're talking about a monolingual English program or so-called monolingual program or a dual language program. So I'll wrap it up there and um, look forward to trying to answer at least some of your questions. And again, thank you for being here. The, the fun, there's, actually there's one more slide, sorry. There's a fundamental principle that comes uh, out of all of this. And that's that if you want students to emerge from schooling after 12 or more years as intelligent, imaginative and linguistically talented, then treat them as intelligent, imaginative and linguistically talented from the first day they arrive in schools. And this means we need to plan collaboratively across the curriculum to ensure that students have opportunities to engage in an intellectually challenging and creative projects in both their first and second language that affirm their identities as powerful language users. So I'll stop there and we can move on to, uh, to, quest to questions. Thank you. That's great, Jim. Thank you so very much. Um, what a wonderful reflection of your work over the past decades and then taking us to the current time as well. We'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, and those, those that we don't get to, we will take time to respond to them in writing with, with Dr. Cummins and our friends from Caslon, and then post them to the website as well. Um, I think one question that came about, and I think um, there was such a, a refreshing reminder in your, in your research and the work that you've led us in for so many years about the needs of our linguistically diverse students. And one colleague is asking, um, this is from Yudilko Porter's um, Scoos, um, I'm wondering if you might have some suggestions on still, still we face this now in 2020, about how to go about convincing colleagues who do not believe that, in, that linguistically diverse students experience racism, disadvantages, and discrimination, and that they should receive differentiated and extra supports. Do you have any suggestions on how um, colleagues can be engaged and brought into a conversation around that? And um, that's a great question, and it's one that comes up uh, a lot because um, it's a lot easier to uh, appreciate or to be aware of racism if you've received it, if you've been on the receiving end of it, than if you uh, are blind to it. And uh, obviously, I think we need to um, engage in discussion of these issues, and we need to be able to articulate the ways in which racism operates in subtle ways. And in the, the book that um, Raymond D. Sol and, and uh, I wrote, which document his experience as a principal in, in Sanchez School over 13 years, one of the, the, the things that comes out strongly in that was the role of active communication, active collaboration between uh, uh, teachers talking about these issues, bringing resources in to uh, identify um, uh, what's happening and, and what are some of the uh, barriers to students' achievement. And so strong leadership obviously is important in, in making this happen. Uh, so the teacher creating spaces where students or where teachers, uh, sorry, the principal creating spaces where teachers can collaborate and discuss perspectives and gain a greater understanding of what their students' needs are. But it's, it's certainly not uh, something that happens magically or that we can just give people the facts and, and um, expect them to come around. These are long ingrained attitudes and even well-intentioned teachers uh, can uh, be unaware of just how racism operates in insidious ways in our society and in our schools. Thank you. I think we have time just for one more question and there's a lot more so we will be doing some written responses and posting them. I think one thing that stood out to several commenters, um, people that commented, um, and one especially from Eugenia Mora Flores, as we look back at, the, at your research over the last decades, and I think there was a lot of connection with seeing the different books and publications you had, um, what significant changes have you seen over time in your research? Um, what are some areas that you've seen really lifted up and what are some areas of challenge and growth still? Well, I think the challenges are, are still uh, there in the sense that um, there is a, a willful blindness to uh, uh, disparate funding for, for different schools. The, the fact that um, uh, schools serving low-income students get, often get less money than schools serving more affluent students is inexcusable. Uh, that hasn't changed despite many people pointing it out. Um, there is, um, as the previous question highlighted, there's still um, an 
reluctance on the part of um, some educators and, and many policymakers to acknowledge that racism still exists. Um, and uh, that is an ongoing conversation. But on a positive note, what we've seen um, over the last um, 20 years or more uh, is the fact that the research supporting dual language education is now absolutely uh, concrete and uh, overwhelming. There have been uh, numerous uh, uh, syntheses of the research, uh, all of which are consistent in highlighting the fact uh, that students in dual language programs uh, that focus on developing both their languages, so students from, say, Spanish-speaking backgrounds uh, whose literacy skills in Spanish are promoted at the same time as they're learning English, uh, by the latter grades of elementary school, these students tend to be doing considerably better, significantly better from a statistical point of view compared to stu similar students who've been educated only through English. Uh, and that has been documented by all kinds of um, uh, national studies and national research um, uh, uh, syntheses. So basically what this means is that any policymaker, any educator, uh, any politician who says, well, bilingual education doesn't work, these people do not deserve our respect. They have not uh, read the research, they're not interested in looking at the research, and they don't have the best interests of kids uh, uh, at heart. So we need to highlight the fact that this research is out there, and if we want to have a conversation about this, look at what the research is saying, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but there is no question amongst any researcher at this point that bilingual education and or dual language education, if we want to make a distinction between them, uh, is by far the most uh, effective way of um, engaging students academically and promoting their overall academic achievement. Thanks so much, Jim. That was incredibly reaffirming. Um, I will let you know that there are dozens of questions. And for those of you that wrote them and we didn't get a chance to address them online right now, we will be providing a written response and that'll be made available on the Kabe virtual community website at um, www.kabe2020.org. And at this point, I'd like to um, pass it back to our president of the Kabe Board of Directors, Olivia Yaya. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Cummins. What an inspiring, timely, and significant presentation. This has been a powerful addition to our Kabe 2020 virtual community webinar series. Remember, the recorded session, as well as any handouts, will be posted on the Kabe 2020 virtual community website following today's presentation. I'm excited to share that we will be welcoming Dr. Kathy Escamilla tomorrow Wednesday, April 15 at 2 p.m., also sponsored by Caslon Publications and Consultants as a continuation of our Kabe 2020 Virtual Community Webinar Series. Again, thank you to Jim and Caslon, and thank you to all of our participants for joining the Kabe 2020 Virtual Community. On behalf of the Kabe Board of Directors and the full Kabe team, we hope you have felt the Kave connection, inspiration, and love just as if we were together physically at the Kave 2020 conference. Please stay safe, be well, and know that we are all in this together. We are Kave strong. Thank you and hasta la próxima. <laughs>